and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, we have a great turnout for today's event. I think we have over 160 people who are registered to attend. And I'm also looking forward to announcing the topic and presenters for our August webinar later in the program. The SWS webinar program has been proven to be a great addition to our membership benefit, and we're excited about the opportunity to provide our members with more engaging educational content as we move through the remainder of the year. The general format of today's webinar will be a 40 to 45 minute presentation by our speaker, followed by approximately 15 minutes of questions from the participants. So before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping announcements. Just to familiarize you with the GoToMeeting screen, there is an attendee control panel where you can control the audio for the webinar by either using your telephone or your computer speakers. And I wanted to note that everyone's, uh, all attendee phone lines are on mute to cut out the background noises and distractions. And at any time during the presentation, you can type your questions into the questions pane. And I'm going to read those questions to uh, Jeff, our presenter, at the end of, the pre of his presentation. And the webinar is being recorded today, and you'll receive a link to that recording following the webinar. And we also ask you to take a moment to complete the evaluation survey that's going to pop up after the webinar concludes. So that'll help us to plan uh, future events, the future webinars. If you'd like a copy of today's slides, uh, please find a PDF copy in the handout section of the control pane. And if you would like to tweet, use hashtag SWSWebinar to tweet about today's webinar. And we love seeing what you have to say about these events. And then we'll uh, just test the questions pane right now and at the same time get a little demographic information. So if you could put in the uh, state or country you're participating from and how many people are viewing the webinar with you. So go ahead and type that in now on the questions pane. So I'm seeing a lot of people from the Northeast. I see some people from the Southwest in the United States. Uh, Canada, we have uh, some folks from uh, out West. Uh, Puerto Rico, uh, one person there alone in Puerto Rico and uh, a bunch of different people. So great, thank you very much. Keep putting that in. We're gonna collect that information so we know where everybody is uh, attending from. So now with the logistics out of the way, let's get started with our webinar. So it's my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, Jeff Trulick. Jeff began his career in wetlands working on an EPA acid precipitation research effort as an undergraduate at Pennsylvania State University in the late 1980s. And after graduating from Penn State with a Bachelor of Science in Biology in 1990, Jeff joined the Army Corps of Engineers regulatory program in the Baltimore, Maryland district. And then after six years, Jeff moved to the district's planning division where he served in a variety of roles until he joined the Corps' headquarters office in Washington, D.C. He has been a member of SWS since the mid-1990s and currently is the president of the Mid-Atlantic Chapter of SWS and also the chair of our uh, webinar subcommittee. And today, Jeff is going to talk to us about a number of case studies that highlight lessons learned from his experience with planning, designing, and implementing major wetland restoration projects. So welcome, Jeff, and I'll now turn things over to you. All right, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with everybody and have such a great turnout for a uh, discussion that uh, I'm going to have today. Try to advance the slides. Next slide, please. So the goals of this webinar today on large scale uh, lessons learned. Um, to summarize and explain the, kind of the, how the Corps got involved in the restoration program, uh, aquatic ecosystem restoration, specifically uh, wetland uh, habitats. 
Um, also to explain the different life cycle phases that we go through in the Corps of Engineers when we're planning, designing, constructing, and sometimes uh, operating and maintaining uh, some wet, uh, major projects. Present some lessons learned from a variety of case studies uh, from around the country in different regions and suggest some emerging issues that are uh, popping up now in some uh, wetland restoration programs and then hopefully to get some great questions um, that we can that I can answer um, at the end. So for those of you unfamiliar, uh, especially maybe outside the U.S., the uh, wetland-related federal legislation that we've had in the in the U.S. Uh, there's the Swamp Acts uh, back in the 1800s, right? The it, the effort was to expand the country, uh, get a lot of agricultural uh, production going, form new cities as we move west. Uh, so there was the Swamp Acts that were basically land acts to drain uh, wetlands or make them more productive could be because they were seen as wastelands uh, uh, at the time. So they had uh, no use uh, to anyone. So the, some of the legislation was directing us to actually drain them as a nation. Uh, we've also, the Corps of Engineers has laws that we work under um, in the 1800s and early 1900s called the Rivers and Harbors Act. These were all about navigation and implementing uh, ports, coastal ports to get uh, goods and services in commerce uh, from other countries and exports from our countries. So that we had the Rivers and Harbors Act back in the 1890s. Uh, in the early part of the 19, 1900s, we had several federal legislation um, acts explaining that we need to do a better job at considering the impact of what the government was doing on the federal uh, and state uh, trust resources as far as fish and wildlife go. So several acts, um, Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act being in 1934, directing the government um, and a uh, uh, large part of the Corps of Engineers to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Interior, the state agencies um, that were out there on the impact of what we did um, to wetland habitats and other river habitats um, so there are several of those that um, still form a lot of uh, how we engage with the other agencies on these things. Um, there were flood control acts back in the uh, 30s through the 60s. They were very single mission purpose. Uh, this is how we got into a lot of our large levees and our large uh, flood control dams. And then came along the National Environmental Policy Act. The Fish and Wildlife Coordination Acts weren't really um, answering the mail as far as um, uh, coordinating and fully considering the uh, impacts of what we were doing and so we ran into the need for further legislation which was enabled which was the National Environmental Policy Act. This is where the environmental impact statements come from um, that some of you may uh, know about that we prepare for our projects. And then there were subsequent uh, laws such as the Clean Water Act and I apologize because my screen went blank. Uh, <clears throat> Clean Water Act and, and the amendments in 1972 and 1977, those are where a lot of our regulatory program uh, came from and it also affects how the Corps of Engineers does their projects. And the main way we do things now, um, we get authorities under the Water Resources Development Acts. So we call them WERDAs. Uh, they usually come <laughs> every couple of years. They've been, they've been um, delayed in, in several years, but when you think of a Corps of Engineers study of an ecosystem or a flood project or a navigation project, or when we get authorized and we get permission to actually implement those, those come through the Water Resources Development Acts and then our annual uh, appropriation uh, that we get, like any other agency at the federal level gets, uh, the Energy and Water Appropriation Act is, is our funding legislation. Next slide, please. So that gives you a kind of a backdrop um, for how we get permission to study and implement things that are related to major wetland projects uh, in the government. We have a lot of small ones, but also uh, that's the, the big driver on a lot of the large scale ones that we do. 
the restoration program has kind of been formed over time. Word of 86 is kind of the, the, the granddaddy of, of a lot of these um, large programs. It was the first time we implemented cost sharing on projects. The Reagan administration brought cost sharing into the mix. Uh, before that, we did projects, uh, but they were 100% federal uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, cost sharing came along and changed the way we do our studies with our uh, sponsors and stakeholders and also the way we uh, uh, prioritize and implement studies. It gave us what was our first official uh, restora wetland restoration uh, um, section, which is Section 1135. These began as very small-scale projects, pilot projects, testing out, can the Corps go back and fix some of the damage that their own projects have done? And that's uh, what Section 1135 is all about. That still exists and is still a small-scale program. Uh, we do a lot of work there on wetlands and other things, but it's not necessarily uh, what we tackle the large-scale projects in. Uh, the Word of 92 was the one of the big first projects we got authorized, very large-scale, for the Kissimmee River in Florida. Um, we were told, and I'll uh, give you the details later, we were told to fix uh, what we had been directed to do um, uh, to, to that river to, for the single purpose of flood protection um, many decades earlier. Uh, Word of 96 and Word of 07 uh, gave us Poplar Island, a mar major large-scale restoration job in Chesapeake Bay. We're rebuilding an island. Uh, 1,100 acres in size. We're do, it's a lot of uh, beneficial use of, of dredged material from the Corps' navigation mission, which is uh, keeping the Port of Baltimore uh, open and functioning. Word of 99 uh, gave us SERP, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program in South Florida. Uh, this is, you know, what you know, <clears throat> a lot of people feel is one of our bigger efforts right now, uh, saving the Everglades, restoring the Everglades, the river of grass, how do you get the water from uh, the upper part, the central part of Florida and in, in, in Lake Okeechobee back to uh, flowing through the Everglades to try to restore some of that historic hydrology. Another case study I'll, I'll highlight is from where to 07 is the Middle Rio Grande Bosque uh, wetlands. These are cottonwood and willow wetlands along the Middle Rio Grande River out in the desert southwest. We have several different projects that we've done out there and several different programs to help restore some of what we've lost along the, the Middle Rio Grande. And then um, a lot of the theme you'll hear about is the historic and ongoing beneficial use of dredge material uh, that we have going on um, all over the country and we've had going on even prior to Word of 86. We were doing some of that. Next slide, please. So this life cycle analysis is what I was um, referring to earlier. And the, what the, the big difference with the, how the Corps of Engineers does things is a civil engineering enterprise versus how maybe a developer or some other smaller scale effort uh, might not have as a significant uh, chunks of, of um, phases to go through as they develop their, pro their smaller scale restoration projects. There's four basic phases, right? Project planning, project design or engineering phase where you take the plan and you give it a little more uh, specificity uh, of the details of the footprint and how it'll work and, and, and some of those issues. And uh, project implementation or construction phase, which is when we get into, the, you know, the when we get a, a legislation and a word to actually implement something, uh, that's when we move into construction phase with our partners. Um, and then there's project operations or post-construction phase. This is what we call O&M, uh, operations and maintenance. Uh, this can sometimes be cost shared in the, in, in the um, legislation, say, for the Everglades program, or sometimes we get into the situation where normally where we finish a construction and we turn it over to our local cost share partner, usually a state or, or a county or some other entity, uh, and they kind of take the project over once the initial construction is finished and monitor it over, over the longer term. We're constantly learning something new. Every single phase, almost all the time, we're learning how to do things better, more efficiently. Um, and longer time frames that we deal with in some of these multi-year planning efforts, multi-year design and, and construction efforts, some of the projects we do 
that are a scale that it takes, you know, a decade or more to get them fully fleshed out, like Poplar Island and some of you know, the Everglades projects. Uh, those are very, very long time frames, so you have an opportunity to learn a lot as you go and constantly tweak and improve, um, but it also uh, can be <laughs> somewhat uh, trying of your patience uh, watching things move so slowly. So that, that's the dichotomy we have. Next slide, please. So project planning, lessons learned. <clears throat> we were just talking about this earlier today on a project here. Conceptual ecological models, they're extremely helpful. They don't get to every nook and cranny of the ecosystem or the wetland you're working on. But they can, if you're working on a very large scale, <clears throat> there's so much noise going on that even to the experienced folks dealing with restoration, uh, it's good to just diagram this out. These are boxes and, and wiring diagrams. I'll show you uh, some examples. Um, but they identify some of the key drivers, some of the key stressors on the ecosystem of the wetland you might be working on, some of the outputs. What are your goals? What are you going to measure? Um, so they're, they're very good at, at laying out um, in, a, in a, a diagram or a figure for both the experienced folks and for, say, the public and stakeholders. You know, what are we going to focus on? Let's organize our thoughts rather than just jumping in and trying to monitor everything. Um, they can fo help focus the data collection and the, and the analysis you would do, uh, especially when you're planning the project, but also as you go through the subsequent phases. And CEMs can also focus and support the monitoring plans that we're supposed to have for large scale efforts and the adaptive management uh, needs that the project might have. What are things could go wrong? What are things we don't know? Uh, what are we going to monitor? And what are some of the triggers for making changes to the project in its operations phase to make sure that the taxpayers and the, the habitat uh, and the stakeholders are getting uh, what they thought they were going to get uh, when we started planning and investing uh, in the project? Next slide, please. So here's a very simple example. These are very good communication tools. You can see these in a lot of places around the country. A lot of schools use these for elementary and high school. Um, but it very, it's a very simple picture. And people can clearly understand and get their minds around uh, what are the big issues here? What are we going to focus on? Um, so this is just an example I found of, of uh, some, you know, some pictor a pictorial way of explaining. What, um, so this is one CEM example. Uh, next slide, please. So then this is a, what I will call a simple one. Um, it's got some basic boxes and wiring diagrams, some pathways, and it tells you as you move from left to right, you know, what, what are you doing at the beginning um, and how does that driver or issue carry all the way through the basics of your ecosystem? What, how can it focus um, so that you're getting the restoration uh, of the fish-eating birds, in this case, uh, on the right? If you want to optimize their habitat, what do you have to manipulate and focus on as you plan the project? What might um, threaten uh, that output also? Is there an algal bloom or is there some other thing that might, you might have to pay attention to um, that could compromise uh, you achieving your benefits? Next slide, please. So this is a comp more, more complex one. This is as complex as I'm going to show you. There are CEMs we do that have many more uh, drivers and stressors and, and targets than this, um, but it gets to the point where, you know, if you get it too complex, it doesn't facilitate that basic communication and thought process and kind of focusing what are the key things, the big drivers and, and stressors and goals of the system. So the take home here is if you have a large scale system, if you get into a large scale uh, effort, um, find some experts, have a, an organized meeting where you sit in a room for a day or so and diagram out one of these conceptual models. What do we need to focus on? What's broken? How do we fix it? What's the best way to measure to make sure we've actually uh, fixed the wetland system that we were trying to address? Next slide, please. So this is another project planning example. Um, stay flexible, right? I call this the Murphy's Law of Civil Works. If it can go wrong, it likely will go wrong. We work in big systems. We do a lot of activities. 
with big bulldozers and backhoes and things that aren't very forgiving. If things go wrong, they're going to go wrong sometimes, and you got then you're going to have to spend time fixing those. So kind of plan ahead. What what could happen during construction, especially, and, and how can we uh, uh, make sure we have a plan robust enough to to kind of absorb that? Um, there are known unknowns. What data did you not get? Uh, it would have been nice to have, but we couldn't afford to get it. Uh, or we didn't need to get it to make the decision on, on how to fix the system. Um, there are unknown unknowns. Don't think that you know everything about a system. Even if you collect a lot of data, there's things that you're going to find that when you dig into the ground, <laughs> you didn't anticipate. And you have to, um, the team needs to be experienced and flexible <laughs> so that you can address these issues in a, in a cost-effective manner when things do pop up. We have cost increases and contingencies on projects. Um, we have billion-dollar efforts that are going on. You know, if one thing goes wrong and it, costs, it throws a million dollars into your cost uh, um, estimate during construction, you've got to take that some, uh, out of somewhere else. So the more uncertainty you have in, say, how much excavation you're going to do, if you have $40 million worth of excavation, but you don't really know the elevation and how deep uh, you might have to excavate to water or something, or how much water you might be dealing with, you might need to b uh, bump up the contingency on that uh, excavation item so that you have you think you have enough money to cover it and you don't have to rob it from another, uh, another part of your cost estimate for your project. The example I have here, this is a ground sloth in the Everglades Ag area in uh, Florida. They have stormwater treatment areas, very, very large stormwater uh, areas where they um, try to shave off some of the phosphorus that comes out of some of the uh, Lake Okeechobee areas. In 2006, they dug down, didn't know, hit, they were prepping the site, and they hit a ground sloth skeleton that was in the ground. So that'll throw a wrench in your construction schedule when you start pulling up prehistoric um, mammals that nobody really knew were uh, there. And so you had to do, we had to do work. Um, in this case, I think it was mostly the South Florida Water Management District did the work um, on uh, recouping and kind of excavating that and making sure we deal with it appropriately for what it is um, versus you know, um, just moving forward and, and, and construct right through the, um, the fossil we found. Next slide, please. So public and stakeholder engagement in these major scale efforts is key. We need uh, cost sharing partners. We need what I will call raving fans uh, of projects. When they're this big and it take this long, you really need a, uh, kind of a fan base of folks who are willing to go to bat for the project. And you're not going to be able to have that fan base and the stakeholders engaged if you're not transparent about it. So have public workshops. Get the visioning done up front when you're in planning phase. You know, you might not be able to satisfy everyone, but at least they can say, well, you know, they did call us in. They did get our advice. We had several workshops. We framed all this out. And then the Corps and their sponsors went this direction uh, on the wetland restoration that we were doing. So you, you might not answer all, all of their needs, all of their concerns. Um, but, you know, having them at the table is key because sometimes you get free expertise and free information just by having an open workshop at the beginning as you scope your, your study and your project. Uh, be transparent in your decision making. You're using public dollars. These are usually public projects, very large scale, you know, funded with taxpayer dollars. So it's key to um, have people know how you made decisions as you went along and, w and what decisions they were. Uh, use uh, planning tools to select most cost-effective measures and plans. We've got software that we've developed um, called IWR Planning Suite, um, and it will you can load all your information in there, your costs, your benefits in, in acres or habitat units, and it'll show you the best buys uh, for what you're uh, investing and the best output you're getting. And, and you can either select those or, or choose to go a different path, but it, it will at least show you for what you're putting into the computer, here's this, the increments that you should think of in, in the different scales 
for how to be the most efficient with your wetland restoration. Don't overthink the small stuff. If it's, if it's not critical to your project and it's not going to make a difference in your decision making or if it impacts all of your decisions the same way, all the different options you have in the same way, then it's really small as far as your decision making goes. So in the planning phase, you got to learn, you know, what what do we need to focus on to make the next decision, versus what's a consideration we need to carry throughout the future life cycle phases. But it's not critical to what we're doing right now. Don't end, uh, don't underestimate the potential um, <coughs> pitfalls um, when we build uh, large scale restoration projects like prairies in the out, uh, suburban Chicago area out in, in, in uh, Illinois, there were uh, airports nearby. Uh, FAA is very concerned, uh, rightly so, about uh, bird hazards and, and, and avian hazards uh, to large and small airplanes uh, at a lot of airports that they oversee. And, and so you got to be very careful sometimes in, in loca locating these things and then also minimizing maybe the surface water component of your project and optimizing uh, on the vegetated part so you don't have these large birds sitting right next to where jets take off and where people fly into. So that's a potential pitfall of a project. There might other, be other uh, circumstances you have where uh, the wetland restoration that you're doing would be great anywhere else, but you might have a major error going on and you might not be able to anticipate that if you aren't thinking about some of those potential um, complications right up front in the planning phase of the project. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is uh, more out of the design phase. We moved into planning, uh, from planning in the design phase. <clears throat> we usually recommend that the, um, the planning phase of a project can probably get their cost estimate correct based on about 30% detailed design, no, no more than 60, 65% of a design detail. You're not going to construct this thing tomorrow. You're just making a decision on which plan you should do. Um, so uh, some projects will need more detail on some items like water or geology more than other items. Um, so uh, you, that varies from uh, discipline to discipline. but um, Save the detailed design issues and the really micro analysis for the design phase uh, because it really it might not really relate to uh, the plan the planning decision you're making. Develop the information that's actually needed versus what might be nice to have. Just because you have a large scale study going on doesn't mean you have to fund all of the monitoring and all the data collection that that somebody might want. You really only need uh, what you need to make the de uh, the planning decision on what you're doing. Um, engineers might be, need one level of detail to say, uh, oh, I know enough about the quantity of material I've got to excavate out of the way to restore this wetland area. But the permitting part of the world might need a, a, another level of detail. They might not give you a permit until after you've designed your project. So know the context you're in. Consult with the permitting folks on, along the way as you're developing the plans so they can see what's coming, and you can get their kind of buy-in or their, their thoughts on what might be, uh, you might be facing to permit this large-scale project uh, as you're planning it versus um, leaving it to the, for design uh, at the end of the design phase. Scale of the complexity of the project. Don't make things, again, don't make things overly complex. Uh, you know, only, uh, do, only focus on uh, the complexity that you need. If it's a simple project, and straightforward, uh, how to fix something like rewatering an oxbow channel along a river, that's not as complex as restructuring the Kissimmee River or the Everglades. Um, it's always good to get outside eyes on your work, right? Sometimes we're not, this gets to the transparency, the external uh, expert review that we do now for, for large scale uh, projects that we, we plan. Um, you know, the Corps of Engineers knows a lot. We've got a lot of different disciplines we bring to bear, but nothing beats someone else from outside the fishbowl looking at your project and saying that that pro is a major problem that you uh, are going to deal with there, and you've not done enough work on that. That that's that's money saved in the long run, um, especially if it <laughs> could jeopardize um, the return on your your investment decisions uh, in construction. 
and expects costs to change as you go through these life cycle phases. Your planning cost should be good enough to make the planning decision, but you may not uh, find that in the end that's the cost to deliver the project in the field. Uh, this is a common issue. This doesn't only impact large-scale projects. It impacts small-scale ones too, but the drama is much bigger the more zeros you have in your, in your costs. Next slide, please. Don't be afraid to go big if needed. If a big fix is needed, right, fix it. Uh, tackle the big thing. Um, you may need to design a, a, a robust solution to have a more resilient <coughs> project or a more sustainable project. Um, we might have a very simple project we could do that's only going to last or the output's only last for, for a decade or so. Uh, we plan our projects over a 50-year future horizon. Um, our engineering regulations actually look at resiliency over a 100-year window. So if you're talking about building structures or building a pump station or building water control structures, uh, they try to design those to, to far outlast the typical planning window that we're looking at of 50 years. 50 years is more of an economic return uh, question. Is, is it going to last long enough that it's going to pay me back for making this uh, wetland restoration decision? Uh, the go big part, Poplar Island I'll talk about later, started life as one of those very small scale projects. We did a study. There was an island chain in the Chesapeake Bay. How could we use dredge material to fix it? It quickly turned into several hundred million dollar projects. So there was no way we could do that without going back to Congress and getting that specifically authorized. But we made the decision, we need to go that big. Here's the footprint that used to be there. Found that during a small scale uh, study, a feasibility study, and suddenly blew it up into a very large restoration project. Consider things like sea level changes uh, and inland hydrology changes and subsidence. There are some things that we don't remember in the planning phase as much. Um, this can affect small scale projects as well if you're building like a small shoreline project. Um, take things into consideration like the potential change in the future of your sea levels, uh, or if you're uh, along an inland river, the Missouri River, the Mississippi River, uh, how is your hydrology and your runoff patterns going to change over time? In the Pacific Northwest right now, they're learning a lot that their climate pattern is leaning towards uh, less frozen precipitation and more uh, spring runoff uh, um, in, in rainfall. So they have to shift the hydrology expectation over time, and they have to adapt to that as they're planning projects, uh, not you know after they're constructed. So it's good to think about these things in advance. Um, refine your soils and hydrology data if needed <coughs> for success. You know we we could get through a planning effort and say you know here's three or four different choices of how to construct this wetland, and, and all of this uh, soils information would impact all of those alternatives the same way. So we're not going to learn we're not going to learn more by collecting more soil information and more hydrology information. Any of these options we choose during design phase, we're going to have to get more information on how exactly close the groundwater is to the surface, how much surface water we're going to be dealing with at what time and what seasons. Um, so you can refine a lot of that information. Uh, during the design phase, and it might change your plan a little bit, but you should anticipate this in your planning uh, of the project so that it doesn't change the plan that you're going to want to do or that it really results in a decision not to do the project at all. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the construction phase, lessons learned. This is the third phase I was talking about before. Uh, once we get a word of authorization, we've done a study, Congress says yes, we believe the administration, Congress say yes, you should do that uh, project, that large scale project, move into construction phase and you get some real money going. 
um, to really build this thing. The, the, the rule I tell people is no plan survives first contact with a backhoe. As soon as you break ground, you're going to find something that nobody anticipated quite frequently, especially on large scale projects. And so you have to be ready to adapt <laughs> as you go. Can you go back one slide? Okay. So keep permits and the red line drawings up to date. These are your construction trailers on site. Your contractor will set up a construction trailer. You know, whether you're a developer, whether you're building a large scale project or a small scale project, there's blueprints in there. there we used them to do our uh, construction contract. That's the that's the, the the design I was talking about earlier. That's what you got your permits based on. But when you get into construction and you start building it, those might have to change, and you make changes in the field. And we usually call those red line drawings, where they'll show the change right there on the blueprint. And sometimes they're significant, and sometimes they're just minor things that you've got to clean up. So it's always good to have your permits in the trailer right on the wall and constant communication. If you find you need to really change something, like that ground sloth I talked about earlier that they found in the ground, okay, that resulted in a whole bunch of phone calls to a whole bunch of different people. And so it's good to know, have a phone list, who to call if I need to change things. And frequently you'll see some of these um, agencies um, showing up at your job site. And so it's good to know them. It's good to um, you know, know their contact information so that if something does need to change dramatically that you're able to communicate that quickly. And uh, if it's possible, let the public see the site. Put up a viewing deck or a viewing area. Um, it might not be safe in some circumstances. Other circumstances, uh, it might be very good um, as a major construction gets over uh, to let people see what's going on so that, um, so that they can learn as well as we build some of these very large scale efforts. Next slide, please. So you want your contractor to make money. Contractors are there to make profit. You aren't there to bankrupt them. Um, you don't, you're not necessarily there to save their, their uh, company for them. But if your contractor starts losing money, everybody's losing money. That's just a bad situation to get into. So don't be afraid. Uh, you want your, your contractors, your, especially some of these major construction contractors, they're there to make money because they know how to efficiently build these things. Um, especially on these multi-year large-scale efforts. Um, so don't, don't be concerned that your contractor is actually making money off it. That means they're building the project more efficiently than you thought, and so they're actually uh, deliver, <coughs> delivering it for less, which makes them more money. Um, give the machinery room to operate. Don't pin them down. Uh, time is money. If they have to drive around places because <coughs> you can't get access somewhere, because in the planning phase you decided we're going to pin them in, Right? I'm a planner. I don't drive bulldozers for a living. I, would, I learned early on, let the yellow machinery operating people do what they do best and give them the latitude to make those decisions in the field with the construction folks rather than having to run back for permission all the time. Um, it's a good, uh, having a pre-construction meeting, especially on a large scale uh, wetland effort, can can pay off dividends if you give them a vision. Maybe take them to a reference wetland or, a, or an adjacent reference wetland site and say, "This is what we want it to look like when we're when you know when we're all moved on and the trees are regrown or the swamp is regrown. We want it to look like this." A lot of the machinery operators were trained to make things very flat, make them slope to this side like a road, make all the water run off to a certain area. So you got to almost retrain some of these folks to it's it's okay if it looks a little sloppy because that's going to enable a healthier ecosystem over time. Um, so sometimes if you show them the vision of what you you're, what you're intending, uh, they have better ideas for how to get that delivered in the ground um, rather than uh, just going with what's on the plans. Sometimes it's hard to put some of these these uh, ecosystem requirements on blueprints and things like that. So it, it's good to have pictures and a reference and maybe a, a pre-construction workshop with them. 
Um, they'll be innovated to bring better solutions. A lot of these folks, we had one uh, guy that um, he took a backhoe and welded, uh, he cut his bucket off the backhoe and uh, re-welded it so he could reach around the tree from the side, not hit the tree, but reach around the back of it and pick it up out of the ground. And he could move a lot more trees a lot faster that way. Um, but he did that on his own. Um, he knew what we needed. We needed trees that didn't have scars on them. And so he was able to adapt and, and retool his machine, um, but we wouldn't have been able to come up with that on our own and, and require that. Um, so that's kind of some, some of the innovation we can tap into out there um, as we learn these. Explore different contract types. This is a lot of times the government operations, we're just moving dirt and water and we go for low bid uh, contracting. Um, but as we all know, sometimes you get what you pay for. So you, on a simple thing, you might have a low bid uh, proposal that goes out. On other ones, you might want to pre-qualify folks. If you've got a large scale, multi-year thing to build, you might want to uh, pre-qualify some folks. So there's different contracting that you would do on a large scale effort that you may not need to do or may not want to do on a more simple job where it's just you know realigning a little bit of a stream or building a smaller wetland. Next slide, please. Uh, Jeff, this, this is Kim. As the moderator, I want to give you your little uh, card. To, we have about five minutes left for the actual okay. presentation. Just uh, giving you a heads up. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Can I get the next slide? We may be having a little bit of a lag. He has the operation okay. maintenance phase slide up. Is that right? Okay. Yep. So we, let's learn a beneficial use. I'm trying to cram some time because we got uh, pictures coming up here. Um, thin layer spraying. We do a lot of dredging. We got a lot of navigation going on. It's the oldest mission that the Corps of Engineers has versus the uh, other than the military mission we have. So we have some technology that's been developed called thin layer spraying. This is where you dredge material and you spray it over marshland or, or over uh, a, a, a water area to help rebuild the substrate. Um, of, uh, of a marsh, a, a wetland. We've got a bunch of this going on around coastlines. Um, some other things we've learned in beneficial use, uh, geotubes don't really work all the time. These are like sausage casings that you fill with <laughs> either water or m most of the time sand. Uh, a lot of times they're good for small scale operations, but if you rely on them too much, they can roll. You can't stack them up like you can some other things. And so geotubes are effective in the right uh, circumstance, but usually not for a larger scale uh, placement uh, of dredge material. Uh, find old aerials and get the footprint and then plan around that. The Poplar Island project we'll get to pictures of uh, soon. You know, if you go back in time to the 1800s, there's some very, uh, the National Geodetic uh, Survey on their shoreline maps have very large scale uh, depictions of, of how big some of these islands, coastal islands used to be, coastal wetlands used to be. Um, so that's a good way to document the past and, and, and target uh, maybe the footprint for your uh, wetland restoration. Um, plan ahead for large plant contracts to save money. Sometimes we overwhelm the local nurseries. So if you give them uh, a, a heads up, they can sometimes scale up or find uh, another nursery in another region and, and get some of these plants set aside in advance what you, once you decide you're get really going to need these plants in a, in a certain amount of time. Use fertilizer to fer spur some growth. I think we learned a lot of this um, in a lot of shorelines. We have the dredge material we deal with is very mineral soil. It's not very organic. So if you just place it and it looks silty and sandy, it doesn't have a lot of organic content. So sometimes you've got to spur the growth of the, uh, the vegetation you use by adding some uh, fertilizer as you plant each of the plants. Um, and again, might might require some permitting latitude uh, as far as the regulatory agencies because you have a lot of water you're dealing with in this beneficial use uh, of dredge material, a lot of water content, and sometimes open water placement going on. So that's a little bit different than what the regulatory agencies are used to dealing with. Next slide.
So the O and M phase um, <clears throat> always have an invasive uh, plant uh, plan. If you have Phragmites in your area, if you have other invasives out in the desert southwest, we have salt cedar and a lot of other uh, types of, of um, woody vegetation. Uh, it's always good to have a plan for invasives. How are you going to treat them if they pop up? How are you going to get rid of them? Uh, how much might that cost? Um, <clears throat> have a scaled monitoring plan and a data team. Uh, if you get into one of these things like the Kissimmee River or Everglades or something, that can be a very large scale monitoring plan and a very large team of folks who pour over the data each year and make decisions on how to tweak it for the next year. Part of this tweaking is an adaptive management plan. Have an adaptive management plan and a team. Sometimes they're the same team as the data review team. And so they get together and you can tighten up on your efficiencies on, on your next decision of building that next piece of your ecosystem. Think through some contingency actions if problems are occur. If we get a water control structure that breaks, if we have plants that die, you know, are you going to have to replant the entire site? How much might that cost? So that's something you need to think through uh, as you get into O and M phase uh, and before even. Have public access and, and research access. Sometimes this is very good for um, tours. We have tours at Poplar Island. We have buses that drive around Poplar Island. We have researchers that come in from other countries. Uh, Japan was one of the more recent <laughs> visitors, uh, brought people in to see how, uh, you know, how they might learn uh, from our uh, success uh, of that large-scale restoration. And there's other examples where other researchers uh, can help uh, improve your project as well as uh, export some of the learning. Plan ahead for replacement and rehab of major features. Uh, you do this in the planning phase. This is a part of the O&M requirements. Um, how many pump stations do I have? How many years are those going to go before I need to, to change out the pumps or replace things? So that can be a major cost, and if you don't anticipate that up front, you run into uh, performance issues later. Next slide. So here's some core case studies. These aren't all of them. There's plenty of them around. You probably have one uh, near you somewhere. Um, so contact your local core district uh, and, and ask them. There's other entities out there uh, that we partner with a lot. Uh, Nature Conservancy, uh, Water Management Districts down in Florida. There's other sponsors like CalFed uh, out in California. They work on uh, similar scale efforts with us. Um, so it's not only the Corps of Engineers uh, that you can go to to learn. Next slide. So Poplar Island in Chesapeake Bay, uh, it's 1,140-acre footprint. They're going to expand that with a, a few hundred more acres uh, in, in the future years. Uh, it's it's uh, the footprint resulted from uh, planning discussion we had with Fish and Wildlife Service and other agencies to be half wetland and half upland. So it's half salt marsh like you'd have around Chesapeake Bay, and then one half of it is going to be very much taller, like you know, 20 to 30 feet taller in elevation, and that'll be finished off basically as a forested section uh, with uh, a lot of uh, the typical trees you'd find on on a historic Chesapeake Bay Island. It was authorized in Word of 92, cost about $600 million. The current <coughs> cost, uh, working cost that they have is $1.4 billion. That includes the expansion that, go, that it got authorized in Word of 07. And it's all uh, beneficial use of dredge material to maintain the, uh, the economy of the Baltimore Harbor navigation project. So you think about Panama Canal expansion, bigger ships coming in. We need to keep exports and imports going. Uh, for the health of the, uh, the nation, and so this is a win-win because we don't have to truck the material all the way to the ocean. We don't have to just dump it overboard and it sits on the bottom of the bay. Uh, we don't have to build something different with it. We're actually rebuilding an island that used to exist and the ecosystem facets that used to exist. Next slide. So this is an aerial photo of it. Um, you can see the uh, eastern shore of Maryland in, in the background of this photo, so it gives you a little bit of scale of how large this is when you fly in and out of 
the airport in Baltimore, Baltimore Washington International Airport. Sometimes you fly right over this uh, facility. This is the current outline of it, 1140 acres, and to the left of this photo, they're going to have an expansion of uh, several hundred acres. Next slide. So this is, on the left, you'll see a close-up of the wetland cells that we're building. There's a few here that are open water with the, what we call the cross dikes uh, going from left to right on this picture. Um, to the right is probably the uh, what's going to become eventually a total upland, and to the left is, is wetland. Uh, but you can see some of the micro-grading we do to get some of the tidal features in each of these cells. To the right is a long reach excavator. One of the lessons learned here is you can't reach all the way across. We do what we call crust management. You place the material, you let the top dry out, you scrape it uh, and drain it, and you have to work it uh, uh, to make it all dry out and to get the water to drain off so that you can actually get on the, the material and work it into the eventual wetland system that you want. We could do about 30 acres at a time in any given year. Um, so there is a limit to uh, how fast you can uh, get some of this ecosystem built. Uh, one thing we learned on this was um, originally envisioned we planned it a little flat, um, so we had to um, go back with sea level rise information and do a little bit more topography so that um, we didn't uh, drown some of this in place as sea level goes up. Next slide. So there's much more international and stakeholder and public interest than we once envisioned. It's, ver it's a good news thing. This is very popular at Poplar Island. Um, so there's a lot of learning going on. Uh, a lot of school kids go out there, college uh, tours um, for uh, environmental uh, tours. It's a very long-term implementation. This is decades, you know, so um, it's uh, but versus finding a place to put all this dredge material every time we, we need to, it, it saves a lot of money, and we rebuild the ecosystem. There's also more critters than we thought. There's terrapins that nest out there uh, on some of the sand that came in uh, on the exterior uh, between the rocks, so that's a good thing. We also had some great horned owl issues that the service, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, helped us out with, trying to get rid of some of the great horned owls that were on the uh, island next to us. Uh, that were eating the baby uh, endangered terns right out of the nest on the ground. Next slide. Jeff, while you're waiting for that slide to come up, I think we will have to stop it after the Kissimmee River example. And uh, okay. so we give of the question some time because we're at uh, 153 now so okay. a couple more minutes and then we'll answer the questions I've got quite a few sure so Kissimmee River in Florida this is up river up uphill of uh, uh, Lake Okeechobee flows from Orlando down into Lake Okeechobee uh, in the 60s the Corps channelized 46 miles of it for flood protection it was sing again a single purpose mission uh, we were directed to do <coughs> And we impacted or drained approximately 31,000 acres of wetlands that uh, existed along the river valley. Um, so in 1992, as we were building this uh, from like 60s into the 80s, um, the, the Corps was directed to restore what became known as C-38. It was a canal that we dug. We straightened it out. Um, so in 1992, we were directed to restore it. So there's we're restoring about 44 miles of it. We're re-meandering it. There's some pictures coming up. Um, approximate cost back then, when it was authorized, was half a half a million, half a billion. Um, it's currently about 740 uh, million. Um, so it, it goes up in cost. We're learning a lot, and it was really the first big, large-scale uh, project for the Corps that was ecosystem restoration only uh, as its purpose. Next slide. And the key take home here was we took what nature put out there, we straightened it out for one purpose, we're putting it back, 
we're getting a lot more response out of the ecosystem than I believe that they originally planned. We know a lot more now. There's a lot more critters that move in a lot faster than we anticipated um, while we're doing the construction. And there's a, some pictures coming up if we can get to them. And if not, we can just cut right to, we can show the pictures and cut right to some of the questions. Does that work, Kim? Yes, that works. Actually, I think you're not seeing things as fast as we are. They're showing right now a picture of the C-38 canal being dug. And okay. uh, we can go to the next slide. You can probably see uh, the, now, I don't know if you see it, but there's the channelized river with oxbows created. And then on the right side, it uh, looks like that that's the restored oxbows. But do you see that now? No, I'm still on the, but we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Those were just pictures okay. to show people the scale of the project, kind of like Poplar. These are landscape level projects. That's why they cost so much money and take so much time. It's very difficult to sustain that kind of money over time, especially if you uh, aren't being efficient about it as you go. Now I see the okay, one well, of the think, um, As you just had a Yeah, any segment, questions we have would be good. Money. All right, so let me um, ask this first question was about uh, cost. It says, considering the project you've managed, there, is there a good rule of thumb for managing cost changes throughout design? You know, do you assume cost at 30% design could go up 10, 25, 50%, or by the time the design cost goes up to 60%, what would you suggest for a rule of thumb? We have a law from a WERDA, and I can't remember which one, is, <coughs> uh, has a, what we call a 902 limit, a section 902 limit, 20%. Uh, it's usually plus, but plus or minus, if your scope of your project changes by more than 20% and the cost changes by more than 20%, you need to come back for to amend your authorization. Um, so if you drop a major piece of the project or if the costs go up because of whatever you've learned and things start um, escalating on you. So 20% is kind of the rule of thumb uh, that we use, but <laughs> if you get authorized and then it's 10 years before your project gets funded for construction, 20% um, could float up on you just by the passage of time. Uh, we try not to count that against people um, and incorporate that into uh, some of our cost considerations for, for reauthorizations. Um, but, you know, um, very long term projects for cost control, you really need to know what the drivers are. We do what now what's called a cost schedule risk analysis. Um, given the cost items, given the schedule for implementation, what are the major drivers that you need to be tracking as a project manager and a team that drives some of those costs upward or could? And those are really the way uh, we highlight which ones to pay attention to now. Other items might not be nearly as much risk for your cost. But the cost schedule risk analysis process that we go through now does a pretty fair job of targeting uh, the major things that could really uh, ramp up on your costs as you go. So those are the things to pay attention with. Okay, changing uh, topics here a little bit. Someone asked about what kind of fertilizer do you recommend using in the wetland areas when you were talking about uh, giving the plantings a little bit of a, a you know, a little jump start. Um, I have planted um, salt marsh. You can just carry around a little bucket of just commercial fertilizer. Uh, and you just put a little bit of it in the hole with the marsh plant, stick the plug in, and you cover it up with sand, and usually that's enough. If you think of a garden, you know, you're not going to over-fertilize because that's got issues um, for your garden to grow, right? So it's really, you can ask the plant um, vendor, the contractor, or if you've done some of these or if others have done some of these, you might really want to ask them, you know, what what type of mix. I know there's different levels of nitrogen and phosphorus and fertilizers. Uh, you might have, in one setting, you might have a very strong mix of one type of nutrient, and in another setting where you've got a little more organics to deal with, you might not nearly need as much. So I would definitely go with the context you're in and ask the plant vendor, the contractor, or others that have done successful plants in your area, how, how, how much and what type of fertilizer is good to use to, uh, to jumpstart the plant growth to make sure that you're not losing them right off the bat. Okay, I have two questions that deal with sea level rise and sort of your, how did you incorporate that into your planning and project plans for the restoration projects such as Poplar Island? I had two people asking about how, what did you do to 
and have resiliency for sea level rise? For Poplar Island, it was planned before a lot of people were really talking about sea level rise, sea level change. Um, at Poplar, it's such a big project. It's got its own work pier that they bring in the barges of dredge material on. They have a tide gauge they put in right there. Um, was it really intended to gauge the sea level rise? It was originally intended to know when the water is going to be deep enough to bring the, the scows in, right? But the, the side benefit of it was it's been in construction since the 90s, so they've got a decade worth of information on their actual project sea level rise. What they did was they went back and after they built the first couple of these 30 acre cells, they started designing more humps and bumps into the future uh, cells. So you might have more, uh, more topography diversity in each of those cells as you build them, uh, so that it's not really flat as a board. I think it was an 80% uh, low marsh, 20% high marsh. And so they put a little more diversity of marsh types in there um, and some bird islands, they piled them up in the center a little bit. So you get a little more diversity so you're not putting all your eggs in one basket when it comes to the potential for sea level to, to creep up on your project. I think they also have some, um, some stop log closures or other water, water management board um, activities so they can control the inlet and outlet of water a little better as each of those cells develop. Okay, I think we are out of time, but I do want to say there's one more thing, and here's more of a statement that might be helpful for, for the attendees, um, and that is something about identifying, applying for, and obtaining the various federal and state environmental permits. Uh, because these things, you need to really factor those in because they can greatly affect your scheduling and cost. So I'm sure you would agree with that, Jeff. Um, yep. I want to stop there because we're over time. I have a little advertisement for our next webinar in August, which will be by Jean Christie and Marla Stelk from the Association of State Wetland Managers. And they're, they're going to kind of, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, dovetail with Jeff's uh, presentation on some things about wetland restoration and status and trends in the United States. Um, and also, uh, if we can go to the next slide, i got to put a little uh, plug in for you guys to put on your calendar the, the 2017 annual meeting, which will be in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, I think the backdrop of this meeting is going to be amazing. You'll be able to uh, you know, present your research, network with other researchers, and, and it certainly will have a beautiful backdrop for our workshop, workshops and field trips. Um, and finally, I want to thank Jeff for taking the time out of his schedule to share his experience with us. Um, Jeff, I would also like you to tell people, if you're comfortable, your, what your email address is, because I think there are a few people that might want to uh, ask you a couple questions that we didn't get to. So can you sure. share that or maybe direct sure, yeah. to the website? This, uh, first name, last name, jeff.trulick, uh, T-R-U-L-I-C-K, at USACE, for U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, USACE dot Army dot Mill, uh, as in military, M-I-L. If you Google me, you'll, you'll find my email probably out there anyway. But yeah, well, jeff.trulick at usac.army.mil. Tony just put that on the screen there. Tony just put that up on the screen for everyone to see. Thank you, Tony, for doing that for us. Thank so you. thanks again to you, Jeff, for uh, presenting, and thank you to all of our attendees for attending today. And uh, we'll hopefully see you at the next webinar in August. Thank you. Thank you.